Okay, we want to finish up today with our discussion. Um, we were talking last time, you remember. Everything we talked about up to now has been about banks and banking. And the general discussion that led into that was how do we deal with asymmetric information? Answer, banks make loans and can deal with asymmetric information. But then what I said is there may still be a certain percent of borrowers who need funds, who can make a good case for funds, but banks cannot perfectly deal with this asymmetric information problem, and sometimes then the government gets involved. And so we started talking about GSEs, government sponsored enterprises. And the typical story here is government is helping people or companies, but borrowers, who are, quote, worthy, gain access to credit that they could not get access to just by going to the bank and taking out a loan or some loan company and so forth. And I gave the example last time of a student, uh, maybe you need $50,000 to go to college. Over your lifetime, maybe you're going to earn an extra, if you have a college degree, an extra ten dollars or $15,000 a year for the next 40 years. So you're going to earn, I don't know, $400,000 over the course of your career in higher earnings. And so it's a good investment to invest $50,000 in going to college. You're going to get back $400,000 but a bank is reluctant to make that loan and the reason is that you come in and you don't have collateral and the bank has no guarantee that you're going to finish college, the bank has no guarantee that after you do finish college you're going to get a job and so forth and so then the bank just says no loan. Now I know banks do make loans to students but it's because of things that the government does is what makes that possible. If we go and take all the government out of the story there are going to be very few students who could go out and get loans. Okay, so anyway, and the same thing would be true for uh, people wanting to go to medical school and so forth. Without any government involvement at all, it would be very difficult for people to do that. So anyway, government-sponsored enterprises. I believe last time I put a, just a couple of names up there. FNMA, Federal National Mortgage Association. And you remember I said the popular way of pronouncing this, FNMA, Federal National Mortgage Association, Fannie Mae. And then there are a series of other GSEs, government-sponsored enterprises, that have this acronym attached to it, GNMA, I think Government National Mortgage Association, and its function is very similar. Then there is that's the Federal Home Loan Bank. I'm not exactly sure how that turned into the, oh, by the way, let me put this in. Here's Jenny May. And then there's the Federal Home Loan Bank, anyway, Freddie Mac. It's the Student Loan Marketing Association. They are the ones that are the GSE that's involved in making it easier for students to get loans. You remember, did I tell you their name last time? Sally May. So they've got all these funny little names. Yes, sir. Is there one like IndyMac? IndyMac? Indy that was a private bank, I believe, okay. but not one of these GSEs. And I believe it's now bankrupt. Yeah, yeah, I knew that. Anyway, <laughs> and when I say it is now bankrupt, you could say that about some of these organizations also. Anyway, but they, um, I think that was a private organization. Okay, so the government, and I don't know how much we're going to get into this, but so the government's trying to encourage certain borrowers, make it easier for those borrowers to gain access to credit. This is one way of doing it, is setting up, and um, by the way, there's also the, uh, the Small Business Administration, and I don't have some you know, cute name with May or Mac or something like that for them, but the Small Business uh, Association is making it possible for small businesses to get funding and so forth. So we really like home ownership. We really like, not like it, but we're trying to encourage home ownership. We're trying to encourage uh, going to college. We're trying to encourage small businesses, okay? 
This is one way of doing it. There's another way that government helps borrowers get access to credit, and sometimes that's loan guarantees. Okay, and so that is really separate from this, but the loan guarantees would be something like, hey, go to the bank, apply for a loan, and then basically you can tell that banker that if you can't pay, we will step in, we the government, and make sure that lender does not lose. And so there are VA and FHA loans on homes. And so that is a separate thing. This is by the government setting up these associations. And we're going to talk more about these GSEs uh, here in just a second. Um, this is the first, Fannie Mae was the first of these GSEs, I believe I told you 1938 is when it started. So here we are during the Depression period. Okay. Basically, here's how the GSEs work. Not in every single case, but this is general. You've got a GSE. Okay. And so, started off, there's nothing there. And the government comes out and creates this and sort of smiles on them, says, we're behind you. And the GSE, in most cases, what it's going to do is it's going to be chartered as a corporation. And it's going to issue some stock. And it's going to be set up as a corporation. But this is a special corporation where the government says, we're with you. We're behind you. And so there's a, an implicit, sometimes it's explicit at the very beginning, but later on that's kind of withdrawn. It becomes an implicit kind of a guarantee for this government-sponsored. This is government-sponsored enterprise. It's not government-owned in theory. It's sponsored by the government. But we're going to set up this business. We're going to charter it. It's going to be run like a business. But they've got a guarantee of the government standing behind it. And that guarantee counts for a lot. And so what the GSE does is this. It says, hey, we need some funds. And I've sort of drawn a picture of banks before. And here's the dollars coming in through deposits. And here's dollars going out through loans. This is a financial firm. So the dollars come into the GSE by when they issue bonds. So here's the bond issued. And so there are investors standing out here, right? Investors. And the investors receive these bonds from the GSE, the Fannie Mae bond, the Freddie Mac bond, the Jenny Mae bond, and so forth. And then the investor hands over cash to the GSE. So now here's this financial institution, the GSE. It's got money. I put a little star up and said, oh, they've got the government guarantee. These bonds, these Fannie Mae bonds, boy, those are safe bonds. Because the presumption is this. This is just not some company out here that issues a bond, and maybe they go broke, and that's it. You lose. The presumption is this bond is as good as a treasury bond, that the United States government will stand behind it. That's the presumption. And that being the case, when they issue bonds, it's got a low interest rate. The coupon rate, I don't know, maybe 3%, 4%, whatever, but a low rate. Maybe if there were some private issuer, that they would have to pay 5 or 6%. But maybe Fannie Mae, Jenny Mae, Freddie Mac, so forth, they can borrow at 3 or 4%. Okay, because of this government guarantee, the reduction in default risk. Now, here's the GSE, and let's say that they've got a billion dollars, just hypothetically. They've now got a billion dollars from issuing a billion dollars worth of bonds. So what they do is they contact banks. And uh, others, maybe a savings and loan, and so forth. Okay, maybe a credit union. And they say, hey, you all, you know, we're just letting you know now, we've got some cash, Fannie Mae. We've got some cash here, and we want to buy mortgages. We're investing in mortgages. And so these bankers say, and by the way, let me come over and draw this little picture that we've seen before. Here's interest rate, and here's dollars. And you remember we talked about this concept of interest risk. And then we put this years to maturity down here. And what we notice is that if interest rates go up, we said bond prices go down, but also just the value of mortgages goes down. Right? The value of loans goes down, and the longer 
The term, and mortgages are long term, 30 years in most cases. The longer the term of that loan, the more the loss in the value of that mortgage. Okay, so anyway, imagine making a home loan at 5% today. If you're the banker, you lend the money for 5%, what you basically say is, I'm willing to receive 5% on my loan for the next 30 years. And then if interest rates go up to 6%, what you say is, oh man, if I had not loaned my money out for 30 years at 5%, if I'd waited until the day, I could loan that out, I'd be getting 6%, an extra 1% a year for the next 30 years. Is that much? Well, if it were a $100,000 loan, an extra 1% would be an extra $1,000 for the next 30 years. That's 30,000 bucks. Mm. So the point is that if interest rates go up, then the value of that mortgage to the banker is less because the banker is locked in a lousy interest rate. So bankers hate this getting locked into these long-term deals. They hate taking Interest risk, interest rate risk, market risk. They hate taking that kind of risk. And so here's Fannie Mae saying, we're buying mortgages. And bankers are saying, you know, we were locked in. We owned our money out for 30 years, and we were locked in at 5%, let's say. Now we can sell these, and we don't have to be locked in. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to send some mortgages to... Fannie Mae, Jenny Mae, Freddie Mac, we're going to send them some mortgages and we're going to get some cash. And basically this kind of a transaction is going to occur, I'll put a little piece of paper there and then cash, this kind of a transaction is going to occur over and over again. More and more mortgages are going to be sent by these financial institutions as, that are making loans they're going to sell those mortgages to Fannie Mae. Okay. And that way they are not locked in. The banker says, good, I am not locked in to this long-term deal. Yes, sir. So then the only profit they would have on the mortgage would be like the closing cost? The profit on the mortgage would be basically for all of the stuff that happens up front. Yeah, and it's like, you know... All the stuff that they get for booking that loan is what they would get, you know, for making the mortgage. And it might be, if it's a $100,000 mortgage, they might make $300, $500, something like that. So they want to sell them the mortgages and ship them off as they can. Well, they don't care. in theory, in theory. Well, but the thing is, this organization, they do care about what the mortgages look like because this organization says, I'm not buying any mortgage. It's got to meet certain standards. Okay, and this organization... The, the GSE, Fannie Mae in this case, it sets the standards, okay? So anyway, so now the bankers have reduced interest rate risk, and they have also, I talked earlier about how do banks make a profit by taking in deposits, making loans, but the last thing I put on that list was <laughs> off-balance sheet activities. Well, this is now off the balance sheet. They made a home loan, this banker did, made a home loan, and then sold that loan, and they've reduced this to a fee. They're basically making a fee for upfront booking this loan, doing all the paperwork and so forth, getting all the signatures and all the guarantees and, you know, like filing something downtown with the recorder of the deeds and so forth. And so all of this stuff is the banker's done for a fee, basically. Okay. So this is the nature of Fannie Mae. What Fannie Mae has done is borrowed a billion dollars and then bought a billion dollars worth of mortgages. How many mortgages is that? Let's say these are $100,000 mortgages, and I'm just making up a, a number. Let's say these are $100,000 mortgages. How many of those in a billion dollars? There'd be 10 in a million, right? And then 1,000 millions to make a billion. So 10,000 of these $100,000 mortgages is what Fannie Mae would buy with their billion dollars. Okay, so here's the motive of the banker. We want to get rid of interest rate risk. Now, here's the deal though. The banker may be the one, an investor, that's buying these bonds. And if the banker's buying the bonds, 
the bankers got that interest rate risk back. At least some of it. But then what's happened is this, is the banker said, hey, I was lending money in, you pick some town, Paducah, Kentucky. I was lending money in Paducah, Kentucky to people buying homes there. And if something happens and the local economy kind of turns down, I'm in trouble. So if what I will do is, let's say, hypothetically, sell a million dollars worth of mortgages to Fannie Mae and buy back a million dollars worth of these Fannie Mae bonds, I'm still making loans in the housing market. I'm still incurring interest rate risk because I'm still buying bonds that are long term. But now what I've done is I've diversified my risk. I don't make all my loans in Paducah, Kentucky. Now I'm buying, in effect, a little bit of bonds from everywhere or a little bit of mortgages from everywhere. And I can't go to New York City and California and all that and lend money. I'm in Paducah, Kentucky, but by buying one of these bonds, in effect, I'm buying some shares of home loans made everywhere. And so I've diversified my risk. And there's an advantage to that. The other thing is this. Without these organizations, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and so forth, this is illiquid. If I need cash, forget about interest rate risk, sometimes I just need cash. Let's say a really good customer comes to me and says, hey, I need to borrow some money. I go, gosh, I don't have any money. You're going to lose a customer. If you're in a town and there is some really good customer in town that you've been doing business with, here's what they expect out of you. You're my banker. Yeah, I'm your banker. I can come to you anytime I need something. Yeah, you can come to me anytime you need something. We're pals. And so here's this really good customer, and they come in someday and go, hey, I need a loan. How much do you need? $10 million. You don't want to go, I don't have $10 million. I am so sorry. But that bank across the street does. Why don't you just go over there and make that your bank? No. Don't say that. What you want to say is, sure, have a seat. Can I get you something to drink? You want a cupcake? You want like coffee, tea? What can I do for you? Okay. And so then what you want to do, if you're the banker, if you've got liquidity, you just like say, here, fill out this paperwork. But if you don't, you say, why don't we get started on this paperwork? And I don't know, in the next couple of days, we'll have all this kind of process, and you'll have your money. Don't even worry. And what you want to be able to do, if you're the banker, is, if need be, take whatever asset you have and sell them and get some cash. You need liquidity. Banks need liquidity. Well, look what the bank has done. If they had a mortgage, and they can sell that mortgage. And then if they take that cash and buy some of these bonds, if this is the same bank as sold the mortgage and now they buy the bond, they got something now where they can sell it. There's a, a market out there where these bonds are trading all the time. And so if somebody comes in and says, I need cash, you say, okay, and you get a bond and just sell it to somebody. So we've added liquidity in this market. And not only that, but you can at this point, now that we have these organizations, you can just sell your mortgages right out. Huh. Sure, I can come up with some money. I'll sell off 100 mortgages or whatever I have to do. Okay. So anyway, what I'm saying is this, is that the creation of this organization creates liquidity in the market for mortgages. And what does that mean? Bankers want to be liquid. They need to be liquid. And so when bankers say mortgages are liquid now, Fannie Mae did that. Jenny Mae did that. When mortgages are liquid, bankers say, I feel good about making a home loan. Even if they're going to hold on to it. You make a home loan, you're taking interest rate risk. But if you're willing to run that risk, hold on to it. Hold it for a day, a week, a month, a year, three years, seven years, 11 years. Here's what I know. Any time down the road I want to get rid of that mortgage, I can sell it to Fannie Mae. <coughs> now, if we go back, we had a couple chapters back, we had a graph like this. We had funds, funds, supply and demand. And so our analysis comes in here. Suppose that we, uh, and I'll put a little star over here, suppose that there are some types of loans and we add liquidity to those loans. Here's a mortgage. And we say, boom, we create 
Fannie Mae, now mortgages are more liquid than before, then there is a tendency to say, oh, I like those kinds of loans more than I used to. This is the lender. I like those more than I used to because those are now more liquid assets than they used to be. Greater supply of funds. And now what happens? Interest rates down. We've added liquidity to the mortgage as an asset, and when that asset to the banker becomes more liquid, the banker likes that asset more. And the bankers are willing to make those loans more, and so interest rates go down, and let's go back. That was what we were trying to do, is encourage home ownership. And the way we're encouraging it is we're lowering interest rates in that market. That maybe we would have had an interest rate of, I'll pick a number out, 6%, and now maybe it's 5.5 or 5.25 or something like that. We have lowered interest rates in that market by making mortgages more liquid. And before, they were like the least liquid of assets. You loan the money, it's gone for 30 years. Goodbye. See you again in three decades. But now it's, here's a loan. I can have my money back tomorrow. Next week, next month, next year, anytime I want. There's somebody buying these things. I like these assets more, these loans. And since I like them more, I'm willing to make them more. Greater supply of credit, lower interest rate, and now we are encouraging home ownership. And so that's really, I mean, there are several reasons that bankers have to participate, but all these things that make bankers feel good about mortgages, I can diversify my risk. I can, if I want, avoid interest risk. I can basically get cash, liquidity, anytime I want. All these things that make mortgages look better to bankers says increase your supply of funds in that market, and that means lower interest rates. Yes, sir? Well, uh, some of those like SBA, they only cover 80%, only guarantee 80% of the loan. Well, we don't want to get into all the details of SBA versus the others. They all have their standards. Yeah, the, but there are standards there. But you have got to... If you want to sell a mortgage or a small business loan or a student loan or anything else to the GSE, you've got to meet the standards of the day. Okay, and historically those standards have been pretty high. Now, I'm going to add one thing to the story and it's this. In 1970, these bonds became mortgage pass-through bonds. I said bass-through. That would be a loan to Bass Pro Shop. Pass-through bonds. And there's not a whole lot that we add to the story other than this. Fannie Mae, Jenny Mae, and so forth, they started saying this after 1970. Hey, we'll sell you investors some bonds. We're going to take the money that we receive from those bonds and buy mortgages. And now, you investors that are holding on to our bonds, every month, now we're holding these mortgages, and that means there are homeowners way over here that are paying their monthly mortgage payments. And so the monthly mortgage payments are frequently going through the banks and then passed along to Fannie Mae. And then Fannie Mae says, hey, if you're holding a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars or whatever, ten thousand worth of bonds, whatever bonds you're holding on to, when we start collecting these monthly mortgage payments with some interest in them and so forth, we're just going to send that to you. And so the people holding on to these bonds are kind of like shareholders, and they are just receiving a constant stream of income. And so, like, if I own one of these bonds, I'm kind of like a banker. There's people way over there, and let's say there's this pool of a million or a billion dollars worth of mortgages, and I own $10,000 worth. See, I give myself a hard calculation. See, uh, one one hundredth. So this would be one one hundred thousandth. If I own a ten thousand dollars worth of bonds, ten thousand dollars, then this is one one hundred thousandth of this pool of mortgages that we bought. And so 
at the end of the month, Fannie Mae is going to collect a bunch of payments coming in on those mortgages, and they're going to send me, an individual investor, one one hundred thousandth of all of the mortgage payments that came in that month. And in a sense, I'm lending money out. Now, it took, that money had to go through the GSE and the banks, but I'm standing back here and I am basically making home loans. And I'm receiving money, a steady stream of this. And the problem is, if there's somebody way over here that says, oh, I can't make my home loan my, or my mortgage payment, I give up, I default, then nothing comes to the banker, nothing comes to Fannie Mae, and then nothing comes to me on that one. The only thing is, hey, I've got one one hundred thousandth share in all these things, and so if somebody over there doesn't pay off, since I only own, you know, some homeowner, I only own one one hundred thousandth, if it's a hundred thousand dollar loan, then I only suffered the loss of one dollar. So that's not much. So I diversified my risk. And that's what I was also telling you about bankers have diversified. If the banker is the one who buys these bonds, the banker has diversified risk. And gosh, one person, if you're running a bank and one person says, I can't pay anymore, I default on that loan, that's a significant loss. But if instead what I did is I sold that mortgage, took the cash, and bought a bunch of these bonds, there could be some defaults and that really wouldn't hurt me that much. I've diversified my risk. But these are mortgage pass-throughs, okay? And so here's the long and the short of it. This became very popular. It became popular for bankers. Bankers love this because they like to get rid of that interest rate risk. They don't like to be locked in on these long-term loans where they just hold on to the cash or hold on to the, the loan. And interest rates up and the value of the bond, the mortgage, goes down. They don't like that. They don't like having all their risk tied up in a relatively small number of loans in a small geographic area. They do like liquidity. So if a banker wants to be making home loans and have that kind of uh, asset on their books, then they're more likely to lend the money, sell the bond, and then come around here, so, I'm sorry, sell the mortgage to Fannie Mae, and then come around here and buy a Fannie Mae bond. And now they've got that kind of mortgage debt on their books, but it's liquid debt that they can always sell, and it, they, are not, or they are diversifying their risk among many, many different loans. This is a, it's not at all strange, but it's all strange kind of how it got started. You were going to say something? How does Fannie Mae make its money? How does it make its money? Well, over here, they are getting mortgages that were, you know, like maybe the mortgage has got a 6% interest rate on it. And Fannie Mae can borrow money at a very low interest rate because this government guarantee. And so there's a difference in the interest rates at what they're lending at versus what they're borrowing at. And by the way, Fannie Mae, in theory, can borrow money cheaper even than banks can. They're not passing through all their profits. They are passing through some of this stuff, but they are nevertheless, well, let's don't get into the details of it. But anyway, they come out ahead because what's happening now is this, is that the shareholders of Fannie Mae are feeling pretty good. Hey, we're borrowing money cheap, more lending money at a higher rate. And the shareholders are doing pretty good because of the government's guarantee. Okay. And the reason the government's guarantee is so important is if this were just some company out there and they're just on their own, then what you might say is, hey, let's get in there and let's start evaluating how much risk is in this mortgage uh, pool that they're holding on to. And if there is risk, then eh, I don't want to borrow or I don't want to loan my money to Fannie Mae at 3%. I need to have 4 or 5%. They're kind of doing some risky stuff. But with the government guarantee, it's like, who cares? Risky, not risky, they're not going to default on these bonds. So, this is the way it went for years and years and years. Here's where things went wrong. Bad. And it's a bigger story than just this, but here's where things went bad. Under pressure from Congress and under 
lax standards by their regulators, Fannie Mae started saying, we'll accept mortgages that are not quite so high quality, a little bit more default risk. And then more, and then more, and then more. And the way this happens is, and you'd have a hard time going to actually find something in the official documents, this is all done informally. Somebody who is running Fannie Mae would come up before the Congress, or maybe somebody from the Congress would send some staff member over to see them and say, you know, wouldn't it be so nice if poor people could own their own homes? And then Fannie Mae, who's got these guarantees from the government that makes it all possible for them to be so profitable, Fannie Mae starts going, yeah, I see your point. And so then Fannie Mae says, we're buying mortgages just like always, but now a little bit lower quality mortgage would qualify. And then the bankers say, oh, okay, we're going to make loans that used to be we wouldn't make. We think default risk is too much. We're going to make loans that we wouldn't have made. And so now lower quality loans are being made. That seems okay for a while, but then the economy goes into a recession. And then people who are, let's say, already kind of risky borrowers, they start saying to the banker, I can't make my mortgage payment. And when they don't make their mortgage payment, the dollars don't come into Fannie Mae. And when the dollars don't come into Fannie Mae, Fannie Mae doesn't have anything to pass through. And I don't mean to say this is like everybody defaults, but I mean default rates are getting up in the neighborhood on some of these, quote, subprime loans, the lower quality loans, default rates getting up 10, 15 percent. Uh-oh. And so people not making their mortgage payments, Fannie Mae's not collecting, Fannie Mae's not sending this along. Now people are starting to sell those bonds. We don't like these bonds. They're not generating the income we expected. And then now that Fannie Mae is not passing that money along and people are trying to stand back, and Fannie Mae is writing off, well, we got some bad loans here. Let's write those off our books. And then when Fannie Mae is writing loans off their books, the shareholders who own Fannie Mae start going, hey, we're not going to have a big profit this year. I'm going to sell my stock. And the price of Fannie Mae stock starts going down. And their net worth is going down. They're writing off bad loans. Their bonds are kind of getting stinky. Shareholders are selling the shares. And so in, I guess it was 2008, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac said, uh-oh, crisis. And that's when we tested to see whether the government was really going to stand behind them or not. And the government did stand behind them, but they basically said, you know, we are going to take this thing over. You guys have been private enterprise. We're going to take over not all the, the shares of stock or anything, but we're going to take over management of this. And... Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, you're no longer independent the way you used to be. We've got some really new, tough regulations on you. And the shareholders lost more or less, not everything, but maybe 90%, 95% of their investments. And it all came about because of a couple of things. And one is Fannie Mae, under pressure, lowered its standards of the types of mortgages that it would accept or buy. And then the other thing was, we got into a recession, not only a general recession, but a recession in the housing market. And that caused people, those two kinds of recessions, a housing market recession and just the general economic recession, caused people to start defaulting on these loans. Had they never got into the subprime loans, the lower quality loans, then an economic downturn would not have been nearly so, uh, so damaging to them. But there was a bubble in the housing market that was across the United States, and that's part of the story, too. Anyway, without getting too much into that story, here's the GSE, and the government spent, I'm not going to be able to tell you right now how many hundred billions of dollars, but lots, bailing out Fannie Mae and, and Freddie Mac. They were going under due to these losses until the government stepped in and said, we can't let them go under. On the other hand, we can make it where the shareholders feel punished. And I cannot tell you, I could look it up, but I'm not going to. Uh, but 
the shares of stock in Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, these shares of stock were selling for, I'm going to throw a number out there, $50 a share. And now they're selling for $1.25 or something like that. So the people who own Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, they took a beating too. Okay, so anyway, this is just one little bit of the financial mess that we found ourselves in. And a lot of it was associated with housing. Now, there's another part of the financial mess, and it's not GSEs, but you should know because it comes along at the same type of story, or the same type of story that we've been talking about. So here's Fannie Mae, Jenny Mae, Freddie Mae. Here they are buying mortgages and creating bonds that are backed by the mortgages. So then some investment banks came along and they said, that's a good idea. And so the investment banks went out and they created a bunch of bonds. And they said, we're going to sell these bonds and we're going to use the proceeds to buy mortgages. And so they started basically doing the same thing as the GSEs. And then they got into the subprime loans. That is to say, buying high risk mortgages with that money. And then when the the housing market went south and the economy got into a recession. They started suffering losses on our portfolio and they started turning around going, sorry. And so these bonds lost value. They suffered losses. Their shareholders suffered losses. So several of them were brought to the point of bankruptcy. Some did go out of business and others were just absorbed, purchased by big banking companies. So we had a lot of financial failures. I mean big, not like you know, the local Dairy Queen or something like that. I'm talking about institutions that were hundreds of billions of dollars in assets, and they got into this kind of business, and bad loans. I mean, they, they bought bad loans that lost value, high default rates, 10 15%. And so then they couldn't make the payments. Their bonds became unpopular. And then there's more to the story. Some of the purchasers of these bonds, whether they're Fannie Mae or, or Freddie Mac bonds, or mortgage-backed securities from investment banks, some of those purchasers were banks. And so those banks are sitting around holding on to these bonds saying, those are pretty safe. And then all of a sudden, they weren't. And now those bonds are losing value. And so there were banks that lost hundreds of millions or billions of dollars on their bond portfolio, mortgage-backed bond portfolio, and some of them were put out of business. So, I'm saying that there was a combination of things. One is there was a bubble in the housing market. Housing prices got, quote, too high, speculatively high. We've, everybody knows about how the stock market can get high and then crash. Well, the housing market got high and crashed. And so that crash in the housing market meant a lot of these mortgages went bad, that there was defaults on them. And then everybody who was buying those mortgages and the banks making the home loans, they were losing money. And then in addition to the bubble in the housing market, there was a recession. And so those two things together really did a lot of damage to those who were either holding mortgages on their books or mortgage-backed securities on their books. And also, create a lot of losses for those that were creating mortgage-backed securities. And so altogether, we're talking, I don't know, trillions of dollars worth of losses. Trillions. Let me come back to this, and I don't have the number for you, but way over 50% of all home loans. You think of all the banks. We've got 7,000 and some banks in the United States. 7,000, let's say. We've got 1,200 savings and loans. We've got thousands of credit unions. All the mortgages being made, all of them, the millions of mortgages being made, over half of them end up in the hands of a GSE. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Sally Mae. Uh, Freddie Mae, Freddie Mac, Ginny Mae. Over half. And so these are huge institutions. <coughs> And so when this housing market is crashing and we go into a recession, then the losses are not insignificant. The losses are huge. Questions about this? Now, the other thing I was going to talk about, and I still am, but now it doesn't take so long because we've talked about the subject here 
is this general concept of securitization of loans. We've been talking about loans in general when we talked about banking. That's what banks do is make loans. And we just talked about the securitization, and that's what this is about, the securitization of one kind of loan, mortgages. So what we do is we create a security that is backed by mortgages. The people who buy it are buying a share in the assets being purchased by this organization and the assets being purchased are mortgages. Okay, that creates liquidity in the market for mortgages, makes those more desirable, brings down the interest rate. Also allows diversification and so forth. Okay, well, so that started off with mortgages and it's spread into other areas as well. Car loans, uh, credit card debt, Um, what, student loans? These are the big ones. So what I'm saying to you is this whole process, and I'm not trying, trying to talk about the financial crisis that we've been through over the past uh, decade, but this whole process of securitizing loans you see what I'm telling you is there is a security backed by an asset. The security is this bond. It is backed by an asset that is held by the bond issuer. And the bond issuer got that asset by using the proceeds of selling the bonds to buy that asset. This organization doesn't do anything. I mean, it doesn't manufacture furniture. It doesn't own land. It basically sells bonds, gets cash, and buys financial assets, loans. And then the people who get this bond own a share of these loans. And if there's good news in the loans, there's good news on the bonds. If there's bad news on the loans, bad news on the bonds. And this organization is just passing the dollars through. Yes, sir? Well, with the mortgages, We've got, and the student loans, we're getting some GSE that's doing a lot of this. But when we start talking about the car loans and the credit card debt, these are just mortgage banks that are usually doing this, that are just saying, hey, we'll sell a bond, we'll get some cash, and we'll buy some loans. Okay, and so in that case, it's a mortgage bank, it's a private company that's securitizing these loans. The GSE was started by the government, the first one, Fannie Mae, in 1938, okay? But the idea was popular, the idea succeeded, and so then um, these private, these investment banks wanted to get into business. And, you know, that is, if we think about the economy, and I, you know, our economy goes through cycles like this, and if all of our, econ and it's moving along a trend line, if the economy stayed on that trend line, there's a lot of ideas that will work great. And that's just the end of the story. They just work great. But what happens is we have this, sort of these booms and busts, and over time we're along the trend line, but not always. And what will happen is there's something that's a great idea if you're on that trend, but it doesn't work out so well in practice because sometimes there's this euphoria that gets built in and people go nuts over something, and then it turns around and people go bankrupt. And so that's kind of been our story here. And this is a process that's in place and what we're doing is we're getting away from this idea of the banker makes a loan to a banker is basically makes a whole bunch of loans, sells those loans off to somebody else, that's somebody else issues bonds, then the banker buys those bonds. The banker's still making home loans but not, well I mean the banker makes it but gets rid of it. The banker's still in the home loan business but not so much by holding the mortgage but by holding the bond. Right? And they're still in the car loan business, but not so much by holding the car loan, but by selling the car loan, then buying the bond issued by the mortgage bank that issued that bond. 
And the thinking is, I'm liquid, and the thinking is, I've diversified my risk. And once they say, I've diversified my risk, they kind of think this, I'm not taking any risk. And that's right, they're not taking any risk if we stick on along this curve, but as soon as we had this situation where default rates went up to 15%, uh-oh, you took a lot of risk. You pretended you weren't taking risk, and by the way, a lot of these bonds, the Fannie Mae and Jenny Mae had this government guarantee, but the mortgage banks were getting very high credit ratings, like AAA and so forth, when what they were holding was really risky mortgages. And the people buying these going, oh, I got AAA paper. No, you don't. You got, like, BA paper. And they found out about that when the economy turned around. But anyway, so this is kind of a trend, and it's kind of superimposed on the whole banking industry and savings and loans and so forth. I think that's where we'll, we'll stop for the day, and we'll talk more about banks next time. So long. <laughs>